Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Obviously, this is a hot topic. We've got a lot of people in the room. We didn't have so many people for, uh, for violence, but I'm delighted that we have a, a packed house on a topic that indeed has been fiddling, filling the boardrooms and uh, conferences. Um, they've, it's a topic that's been greatly discussed at length in training rooms and, of course, in the media. Uh, when it comes to the mining industry for the last decade, and it is, of course, inclusive and diverse workplaces. I'm Tina Altieri, and I'm thrilled to be your moderator. We know inclusive and diverse workplaces are essential for fostering healthy workplace culture, where everyone is safe and respected. But the question is, have we really reached the point of proactive inclusion? So let's talk now the opportunity to how we might be able to move the dial and introduce you to our panel. Dr. John Byrne, Commissioner for Equal Opportunity in WA, a role that he's held since 2016. Ms. Libby Metton, leader of the WA Liberal Party, chair of the Community Development and Justice Standing Committee, which conducted an inquiry into sexual harassment against women in the FIFO mining industry. Also, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Trish Todd, Chair of the Work, Health and Safety Commission and the Mining and Petroleum Advisory Committee. And we have Ivy Chen, a geologist. She manages a team of geologists who support iron ore and lithium businesses technically. And she's recognised as one of the 100 global inspirational women in mining. Would you please make them welcome? <laughs> this is a powerhouse panel. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into this. The business case for diversity. We hear that diversity, the, uh, diversity positively impacts uh, organisations' culture. What could you add to that, Trish? Okay. Well, I think there's a lot of research and been so much research done over the last couple of decades about the business case for diversity in the workplace. It's happened at the macro level, so you've got groups like the World Bank, um, the World Economic Forum, uh, correlating measures of gender equity in countries alongside their national competitiveness. And then it's been done more at the micro level where they've looked at workplaces and shown that uh, diversity makes a big difference in terms of how teams function effectively, something that has already been mentioned today, looking at communication, decision-making processes and so forth. Um, and I suspect for many of you in the room, you don't need convincing. You might need to convince some of your colleagues at times, but there is just so much research out there mm. about um, the benefits of diversity from a business perspective. And look, the moment I raised, you know, what is the business case for diversity, I did see eyes glaze over, the eyeball roll. My question to you, and I'd love to see a show of hands, why are we still talking about inclusive and diversified workplaces? Can I have a show of hands? Does anybody else want to know? that we're having to even hold uh, a, a whole one. And you guys are obviously showing your great concern uh, and care for this particular topic, but really, are we still talking about it? So, John, the question is, do we really want diversity? First, I need to let you all know that I'm profoundly deaf. I don't think Stina mentioned that. I rely on speech to text transcription and it can make for some interesting issues <laughs> when talking to groups. Do we really want diversity? Absolutely. In the mining industry, I'll give you two examples where huge productivity improvements might be achieved by having more diversity. One is Rio Tinto destroying a destroying Aboriginal gorge in the Pilbara. That created a huge problem for them. Now, most mining industries have quite good diversity at the lower level. That's about Britain employees, but they're not present at the senior levels where the decisions are made. How much would we have saved if they'd actually have an Aboriginal person on their board, have an Aboriginal person there who could actually stop that and say, hey, let's not do that, that's wrong, wrong. So there's an example where diversity would greatly improve productivity. Now, a second example. You all heard of the BHP train that could out of control? The brakes were locked for one, one hour, and after one hour, the brakes were undone, and off it went down the, down the slope. Okay. Now, the mining industry is almost nobody with a disability, including people with neuro-disability. 
Many people with urinary disabilities have different thought patterns. If they had somebody with urinary disability and there's a system design process, they may well have picked that problem up and resolved it. So you actually do get outstanding improvements in productivity from having people who are diverse in the workplace. Libby, why don't you think the dial has moved that far forward? That's a, a great question, Tina, because as uh, the report indicated, and enough is enough, uh, which I, I had chaired, uh, we haven't seen a, a great movement in diversity when it comes to women in the mining workplaces over, over the last decade. Uh, it is important because it, it leads to better outcomes and, and just adding more women I is not enough. Uh, but quite clearly, and, and what we heard uh, through the report, were, were shocking incidents of uh, sexual harassment, uh, you know, attacks and taunts, uh, people feeling unsafe. Uh, we heard of incidents, uh, Western Miners uh, Union had reported that one in five women had, uh, had been uh, requested sexual uh, favours in, um, in exchange for career advancement. Uh, these issues need to be clearly addressed. And I certainly welcome today's forum. I welcome the response from industry who have um, been uh, certainly very supportive, as well as government who have backed up the recommendations that we have made. But it's not just simply about adding more women, it's about ensuring that the workplaces are safe for those women, that they have uh, more of a, a greater say uh, and consideration uh, in relation to decisions about how the workplaces work, whether it's to do with the accommodation, whether it's considerations around uh, parental leave, and other considerations as, as well. But there's a broader conversation uh, about diversity. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm just talking about women here, but we know, um, you know that diversity is in a range of areas, uh, in, including um, you know, culture and, and race as well. Yeah, and we, um, we're getting those questions in too, Libby. It's interesting. Yes. Say, it, people are saying, you know, we're seeing progress made on gender diversity in leadership, but I've not seen much progress on diversity of people of colour, uh, LBGTQ at that level. Why? Why? Ivy, let me ask you why. And is it more about that capacity to think in a diverse way, that we're just not pushing through there? I think it's a combination of different things. And some of it comes from that, very uncomfortable. Oh my gosh, I've got to think about someone who's not like me and try and bring them into my space. And while it is hard, it's so well worth the effort because you get so much more outside of that fat part of the bell curve. If you bring someone in who's not from the fat part of the bell curve, they're going to bring in all these other extra options for risk, for looking at risk, for finding solutions, for just thinking about things in a different way. And we, we talked about bringing more women in. We need to bring in more people of colour, people of different levels of ability, neurodiversity, mm. and LGBTQ plus people. And sometimes we, like, someone of colour is physically visible, but someone who's diverse in a different way is not so apparent. And until we make it comfortable for them to say, hey, I'm different, this is why I'm different, and this is my value, we won't be able to reap the full benefits of the diversity we may already have and haven't actually spotted. Good question. What comes first, diversity or inclusion? Trish? <laughs> um, I don't think you can have one or the other because if the environment is not perceived as inclusive, then those who would see themselves as being part of a minority are unlikely to be interested in working in the industry. Just going back to your previous, previous question about groups other than women and um, lack of inclusion in the mining sector, I think we've really got to look at management in the same way as we looked at management and said there were no women in management and so you don't end up with women amongst the broader workforce in the mine site. Um, research is showing in terms of um, people from non-Western backgrounds, where there are managers from non-Western backgrounds, they're more likely to look to recruit 
people from there too, so, which is a bit similar to what Ivy was mm. saying. Mm. So let's talk about recruitment, right? I mean, if, if we're, we're talking about bringing in a diverse range of, of people and backgrounds, does that need to change, Ivy? I think it does, and it, we need to change the way we specify who we want. So we're coming to selection criteria. And we need to widen what we consider the meritorious person. You know, when we select who do we want for this role, we usually go through, they trot through the usual, oh, they, they've got this experience, they've got that experience, they've got this many years, and they can drive that sort of software from a technical perspective. But we don't consider that someone from a different background will actually bring a lot to the, the role that we want to fill because we don't even know what criteria we should be adding to our list to, to attract them, to make them look at our advert and uh, to answer and respond to it. So I, I think selection criteria does need work and that's one way to start to open up who we talk to when we're looking for someone mm. to work with us. You've got the brains trust out here. I'm interested to know, raise your hands if you feel that the selection criteria um, has, has its faults at your organisation. Are they roadblocks? Is the selection criteria a roadblock? And do we need to look at something as, I mean, obviously, potentially off the Richter scale, but do we need to start looking at um, job applications and someone brave enough to take age, gender, even names off job applications so that we can start looking at, um, at applicants uh, through you know, different coloured lenses, if you like? I think that is a huge and brave move. I think we will need still to have some identifying characteristics purely just to be able to start to shortlist. But to try to de-identify to some degree and to broaden our selective criteria, definitely. Mm. Isn't, it, uh, isn't it an orchestra? What's the orchestra that does blind auditions? Philadelphia, I think. Right, okay. And, and what do they do in, in, in a, do you remember what they do? Yeah, they, they, they audition all their musicians behind a screen. So all you are competing on is your capacity to produce beautiful music and not how tall you are, what you look like, how old you are, and, and everything else. Mm, fantastic. I love that. Um, I, I don't think we necessarily need to screen out uh, the, identifi the identity of individuals when going through that process. Uh, but I, what I was encouraged by was uh, CME's uh, response uh, this, this morning, which was about and, and the guidelines that they have put together in relation to um, some of the pre-screening work that can be undertaken and uh, a refreshed look at what leadership looks like. Uh, as I had spoken um, previously, it's not just about having diversity in uh, the broader workforce, but in those leadership positions as well, and a, a rethink on uh, what criteria you're actually looking at uh, to ensure that there is a, a broad range of, of backgrounds and experience and diversity is very important. Mm, mm. Before we come to you, John, let me just quickly say to you, John, that um, it's interesting that rather than, someone said, rather than spend uh, our time poaching from each other and moving numbers around, how can we work across the industry to make meaningful and lasting change? And I think that's really interesting. John, let's talk also about unconscious bias. I'm really interested to hear from you. Yeah. I was going to basically mention that. Basically, it's not just the selection criteria, it's the selection process that has unconscious bias in it. Mm. You really must have a selection process that is diverse in itself. Mm. Mix of genders, mix of races, abilities, and so forth. And if the short list comes up without much diversity in it, there's something wrong with that selection process, that selection criteria, that's the whole thing. Mm. Go back to scratch. Make sure you come up with a short list of people who are being considered for the job who have diversity. That is a basic criteria to get diversity in employment. Make sure that the process comes up with a short list. Mm. 
that has great diversity in it. You probably got that. Go and do a, do a search. And pop that people on the shoulder. Get people to apply for the job. They're always out there. I don't believe anybody here tells me. But there aren't any women suitable for this job. They never apply. We've had got people like Elizabeth Gaines, who headed, uh, headed Forsky. You have Meg O'Neill, currently in charge of West Farm. They are out there. Get them to apply. Mm. That was the process that is the problem. Yeah, great point. Um, it's someone said mining leaders have traditionally been promoted through results-driven behaviour. Should our focus be on the middle management culture? And Trish, to, to me, this seems like a, a, a point that, that you would make about there being resistance to actual implementation because of certain problems that middle management face, even simple things like shifts and, and that sort of thing. Do, do you think that's where, do you think that's in many ways where the buck stops? Um, well, senior management need to be setting the priorities. And so if senior management determine they want the organisation to be more diverse, then they should be setting that as as a target and doing things such as John was talking about, looking at short lists and rejecting them unless there are a more diverse selection group. But then if you go down to the middle management who might say, well, okay, now this is raising these problems, they often do need support and discussion and the opportunity to raise those issues um, beyond just the, the uh, financial targets. And, um, it, looking at that CME booklet, they talked about how to incorporate people working part-time, and that's fairly novel for the mining industry, in terms of on-site, anyway. Um, but again, it can, of course, be done, um, but it's the middle management people who are going to have to operationalise it. So it's got to be dealt with all the way down. Yeah. How do you then hire for diversity without building a, a stigma of, of token hires, and, and we hear about that a lot, don't we? Trish, Libby? Um, well, I mean, look, women have had to put up with that, um, you know, where you're told you got the job because you're a woman. Um, it's, I guess, doing your best to make sure people aren't left isolated, so that it's not one woman in it amongst a whole group of men, that there is diversity. And in terms of inclusivity, that issue of not leaving people isolated is really critical. So me the importance of mentoring, um, and, and again, numbers, building up the numbers. It, it does go back to the culture of the workplace. And we had heard throughout the inquiry about women feeling that they were or, or in that position for uh, or, or seen as tokenistic. Uh, and it, that's why it's, it's so important that uh, this culture of respect is supported through a range of, of different means. Um, being able to report on and anonymously report on lower levels of sexual harassment uh, behaviour. Uh, that's certainly, I welcome the 1800 bully line that was announced this morning, but um, to be able to anonymously report on lower levels of sexual harassment goes a long way uh, so that workplaces can focus on areas uh, within workplaces where there might be an, an issue without singling people out, uh, and as well as the other measures that have been talked about in relation to uh, uh, childcare, um, parental leave, uh, other uh, mechanisms for support. Bystander training is vitally important as well. It's no, no longer, it, it should not be seen as good enough just to not be engaged in poor behaviour, uh, we need everyone calling it out for what it is. Mm -mm. You'd agree with that too, John? I'd like to say the idea that women are there at the tokenism is arrant nonsense. If I applied for a job uh, and I found I was a successful applicant, all the other people employed were men. I'd wonder, what the hell am I doing here? Perhaps not on merit. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Ivy. If I could have a chirp in a, from a slightly <laughs> different perspective on tokenism, is that I really don't give a hoot about... I'm happy to be a token anything because, as far as I'm concerned, being the token anything gives me that one opportunity for me to, to do what I can do. Mm -hmm. So it's a foot in the door. 
And not all tokenism is negative. It's just the first. First of many, we hope. But, you know, it's not all bad. So what needs to be done now? Where do we go from here? If we have clearly some pathways forward, what needs to change right now? Libby? Uh, well, um, <laughs> look, there, there is a long way to go. Uh, I have been heartened by the recommendations or the support for the recommendations of our inquiry, the 24 uh, recommendations, 15 of government and, and nine of, of industry. It's about improved reporting, uh, leadership, uh, recruitment processes, and we talked on about the, the pre-screening uh, processes, education, the sharing of information, uh, and uh, Goldfields have, um, as I understand it, will be uh, trialling a, a, um, a framework which can be shared. There's no competitive advantage uh, in not sharing information on best practice when it comes to uh, safer workplaces. Uh, it's important that this issue of, of sexual harassment has now shifted from being a human rights and a uh, human resources issue now to a safety issue as well. It is all of those issues, uh, but uh, we, we recognise that we have a long way to go. The fact that there have been 1,100 people turn out for this forum today, I think is certainly underlines the fact we are moving in the right direction, uh, the fact industry and government have supported this, and, um, yeah, I feel confident that, um, that we will continue to see progress. We've got a, a number of uh, people who've mentioned that gender pay gap data is being published next year. What role would you say transparency plays in inclusion and diversity? Is that something for you, Trish? Um, well, there's no doubt that um, transparency about pay is important and we've seen in terms of the gender pay gap, the mining industry does contribute to our very poor um, figures here in WA, but perhaps most importantly, the greatest gender pay gap is happening at the management end of the spectrum where there is a lot of secrecy, so yes. And I just comment on your previous question about where to from here. I think that um, what I've heard today already points us what needs to happen. We've heard lots of very good case studies, um, lots of indications of change happening in the industry. On the other hand, we've been presented with data that shows there are still serious problems. So each organisation um, needs to look at itself and say, where are the pockets where the problems are and target those pockets? So even those organisations which have implemented really good change programs, we know, all of us from our own experience, there, there are always the recalcitrants or there can be areas which have remained unchanged. So uh, companies need to target those areas. Mm. Mm. Finally, John, can I ask you, it's a bit of out-of-the-box thinking as someone who's obviously been very heavily involved with Equal Opportunity Commission, what is the one thing that you think we need to be thinking outside the box in order to smash through okay. this topic? Okay. First, I'd like to say there are many employers that dominate by men, males, but also employment areas dominated by women. Primary school teaching, 86% female. Greater diversity there would help kids have a role model. Single parent families with a mother to have a male role model. So diversity works at both ends of the spectrum. The public sector, 75% women. Child care, almost 100%. So what are we trying to achieve with diversity? One thing is great productivity. But for the male dominated organisations, there are two factors that they have to address. One is the mention of gender pay gap. Predominantly, male are dominated organisations that have a contribution to the pay gap. And secondly, there's sexual harassment. I never get complaints of sexual harassment from female dominated organisations, always from male dominated organisations. Kate Jenkins' report showed that. She got a list of the type of organisations that have high levels of sexual harassment. They're all male-dominated. Mm. 
So basically, you do need to address that issue of diversity and inclusion as part of addressing sexual harassment. Trish, your final word on how we need to turn the dial more rapidly on this? Well, I'd, I'd go back to my point before where organisations um, do look at the areas where there are still problems um, and the, it, a lot of it does lie with leadership of organisations. They have to make it very clear and set the um, KPIs. So in terms of the mining sector, if you've got the leadership um, in St George's Terrace, then ensuring that that goes out onto the mine sites and holding the managers on the mine sites um, accountable for what happens. Mm. Who would agree, can we have a bit of a show of hands, who would agree that there needs to be more discussion around this, that we just haven't opened the box wide enough to the wider, whether it be middle management? Um, would you raise your hands if you feel that not enough is being said in this space? More needs to be said. Do we need to be talking more about this? Well, that's really interesting because last time I asked that question, there were very few people who who'd said that we need to speak more about it because we've talked about it enough and we're just not moving forward. Uh, Ivy, what do you think we need to be doing to, um, and that everyone can think about as they're leaving the room shortly for lunch? What do people need to be thinking about in order to really uh, instigate change quicker? I think we all can make one little change. And for me, it, it's anyone who's hiring somebody else Take a risk. Pick someone who's slightly different, like my managers did over 30 years ago when they picked this young Asian geologist who was really not on the normal scale. So I got a chance, and <laughs> it works. Just take a risk. <laughs> and was happy to be a token, although I wouldn't call... Yes, but there you go. <laughs> um, and, what a great, and what a great high you ended up being. Fantastic. Congratulations, Ivy. I know you're doing some fantastic, in that, uh, mine, some fantastic work in the mining space. want to thank you very, very much. Trish, Libby, John, would you please thank them, everyone? Yeah.